Well, I hope you guys had a lot of fun on the last sort of set of programs. And now, as I said, we've kind of done a lot of stuff and we're going to be sort of moving forward, returning back and looking at some things that we kind of uh, conquered already. For example, variables. Uh, we're not even going to talk about that. Uh, we haven't really fully talked about it before. We didn't, uh, we're not going to talk about it now and we'll be talking about that in the next chapter. Uh, but for this one, we're, I'm going to try and give you guys a little bit of uh, guidance and help on basically chapter three. And so um, let's go have a look at uh, the book and I'm doing my click path to the book, which, excuse me, is in the links. And I'm going to go to the bookshelf and because of course I've gotten through the book and of course I before class this would have been good to do I did not log on so let's log myself on now and my award-winning password oh and I don't think that's right yeah I didn't think that was right all right what an auspicious beginning to this all right so anyway so in we go we're in continue reading whatever, clicking on the book, and uh, where are we? There we go, chapter, oh, yeah, we don't, that's, let's actually go back to the beginning of chapter three. So chapter three, it's all talking about the shell or the interactive interface. So what in the world are we talking about? Well, for those of you that are, again, kind of new to this, um, what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna go back and when I installed Python on my machine, I can type Python and I get a couple options here. I get the idle, which is the integrated development environment. And I also have straight shot at Python. If I actually click at Python, what it does is it actually opens up a Python interface, right? And uh, tell you what, let's see, can I do anything about this to make it look a little bit better? I think I can, let's get the font and let's get it to be a bit bigger. All right, so there's my sort of Python um, uh, interpreter. It's actually a command line interpreter. All right, so that's cool. We um, also kind of see this, this interpreter is embedded into idle. So if I go idle, idle, this guy here, looks hauntingly similar, right? And uh, up here, if I go to Python anywhere and uh, open up a console, which I think I can do because yes, I can open up a console. Oh boy, that was dumb. I didn't want to open up this console. Let's just exit it out. This is Python 2.7. Who the heck wants to do Python 2.7 anymore? Nobody. So let's go back to consoles and pick a good one. Let's pick, uh, there, 3.8, excuse me, full. Definitely, if you're in this environment, uh, entertain, like, you know, play with some other other uh, things here. All right, so these are all basically three different looks at the same uh, command line interpreter. Plus, there was another one, now that I think about it, that I gave you guys for the course, which I think I've now put into the content section for today. This guy. Python in the shell. The click path, if you don't want to basically get it from the content section, that was also available in links and it was available right there, cloud Python shell. So that got me here. Uh, and actually, you know, now you guys are experts here. This is 3.9, 3.9, that's what it is on my machine. Uh, boy, what was the other one I did? Oh, uh, up in the console. The console's also uh, apparently 3.8. I'm looking there, 3.8. And over here, this guy is 3.8. Why? Because it's actually using the same software to generate a console. Sort of a little pocket universe that allows me to basically talk to Python. So, um, and you know what you did at the very beginning, you actually used the command line interface when you did your hello world. So there's hello world, and uh, let's hit that button, and then go over to here, I can do the same thing, print hello world and so on. All right. Cool. Now, just for the ease of this demonstration, what I'd like to do is I'm going to basically not use Python anywhere. I'm probably not going to use uh, this. And I'm not even sure 
I'm going to keep the idle shell around. I don't know. You know what? We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay. So what, oh, I just lost it. I'm lost. There it is. Okay. What I want to do with this is there is some conversations here about a command. The print command that we've been using the whole time, that thing is, 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 is good. I just want to remind you though, it's not so much a command, it's actually a function. It's actually a function. This will help you when we talk about functions. So print is a function. I pass in a string and then what does it do? It returns the printed string. That's basically what it is. So it, it's a function. In other languages, it is a command. In Python, it is a function. My PC doesn't speak Python. I had to install Python on it. And then it creates this environment where I can type in a command that's interpreted as Python. And then, and then, and then the, the results are echoed to the screen. Right now, this is the first time you've coded. That's about the only thing, the only thing you know. But other languages uh, don't necessarily work like that. So that's why it's it's kind of it's got an extra special effort here to say that the interpreter is a program that reads a command and then checks its syntax and then executes it. Right. So in this case, if I went print hello. It knows that there's a, um, a, a, a uh, it's, it's validating the syntax before it tries to run it. And the first thing it says is, dude, I'm not even going to talk to Python because I don't know what print is. Right. So there's that. Uh, what else do I want to talk about here? So they brought up the shell. Okay. And again, I'll let you look at that on your own. Uh, this is sort of conversations about why, you know, the online thing is good. And then, you know, the fact that idle has got a shell in comparison to, like, like notice that. The shell is the uh, command line plus all these things along the top, like the ability to create your own program, how you want to run the shell, even some basic debugs and so on. So definitely, you know, uh, um, sometimes at this level, when all you're doing is basically a bunch of print statements and inputs, the interpreter is not super useful. But as you start to create Python programs of greater complexity, it is kind of a cool thing to be able to crank up your uh, your uh, command line and basically type, you know, my cool Python, and then have it basically do something, right? And so that's where the command line inter interface is, is is definitely kind of cool. So that was a little bit of that first part of the chapter, but the chapter doesn't end there. You'll notice that what the chapter does pretty well right away is it starts launching into this idea of operators. And so um, I, I would love to, you know, take you through some of this for sure, because this will help as I'm starting to explain uh, other programs. So let's talk about operators. And I tell you what, this just looks so primitive. I'm going to leave this. I'm just going to do it in, in the shell. We're going to do this in the shell. All right. So operators. So here we go. Let's uh, make a really expensive uh, program. One plus two. So one plus two. I want you to imagine when you're using the interpreter, you're basically asking a question. I'm basically saying, what is one plus two? And it says it's three. Okay, what is two plus three? And it says it's five, right? So uh, it, there's sort of a dialogue going on in the interpreter. That's not the same, right, when you're creating a program. When you got a program and I go one plus two and I hit enter, it's going, and then what? And then I go two plus three. And then what? I mean, it's it's not going to evaluate any of this until I actually run run the program. The command line interface is literally uh, executing each command one line at a time. Command line interface. So, um, in my two little questions, I actually had two ideas in there. I have numbers and I have an operator. These numbers actually would be considered literals. They're literals because they are basically hard-coded values. So when I do this, for example, grant, grant is a string, and there it is. It's literally a string. I, I go grant, the so grant string, plus a space, plus uh, my last name. So a couple things I want you to sort of see from that. I, I took this literal string, this literal string, this literal string, and I actually used the same operator that looks like addition. 
Okay, so one plus two, the plus is an operator. That's an operator, that's an operator. Hopefully in your brain, you're thinking, but boy, it must've been way different to add a string to another string. Sorry, to add a string to a string, that's gotta be way different than adding a number to a number. And it is, Python takes care of that for you with the same operator. Not every language is like that. So Python, that's one of the reasons why it's kind of a, a highly adopted language. And it's one of the reasons why we use it to teach because it, it does kind of mask um, uh, some of the uh, complexities that come up in programs. So uh, I would tell you, by the way, in the language that I use mostly, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I would have had to use this operator, which won't exist, right? That operator doesn't exist here, but it, it's helpful as you go into your languages to, to know uh, uh, what your operators are. Now, thankfully, I have given you a nice link to that. In the content section, I've given you, uh, for today, I gave you a link called Python Operators. It's going to W3 Schools. Now, as a side note, W3 Schools is also in here as a way to learn Python, right there, W3 Schools. They got a section here on operators. And so some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today, it's in your textbook, but it's also talked about in here. And I would like to talk about some of these, not all of them, but some of them, all right? Not all of them, but some of them. And please don't look, they all have the ability to try them. So let's talk about this addition for a second. Let's go click on the try it. What does this do? It's kind of got a little console on the side. And if I go run, he says, with a lot of hope, it basically spat out eight. If I uh, change this number to five and I go run, that's the slowest calculation ever, by the way, but it spits out 10. Pretty cool. I actually haven't really uh, checked too much on what these do now. This has actually changed a bit since, since last I left. Okay. Um, so, you know, definitely, you know, give it, Give these things a give these things a shot. It'll really help you to sort of understand what's going on. Now I'm going to make this a bit bigger. Uh, you're probably not as old as me, many of you, so maybe you don't care. But I do appreciate the big. And uh, I'm going to bring up this and move it just so I can have it about like this. Okay, good deal. You know what? Now I realize why I don't like using this shell. I'm going to run out of space really quickly. I tell you what, let me, uh, for my little demo here, let, let's go Python, uh, Python, Python, bring this guy back up. And if you don't mind, let me just test something quickly. Mm. Oh, so much for that. That's why you don't test things without recording them, but that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Oh, restart, would that do it? Oh, you're just gonna go on here. Oh, oh man, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do this to me, aren't you? All right, because uh, I want to basically run through uh, quite a few of these things. And again, if I was a professional YouTuber, I would probably at this point pause and edit. But you know, we're not gonna do that because I'm not a professional YouTuber. I'm going to ooh the visualizer. That's that will give me something for free. All right, good deal. I take the visualizer. Let's pull the visualizer out so it's sitting over here. And uh, and let's uh, thank you for helping me out there. And let's bring this guy back up. And then let's bring the visualizer back. And now, good, 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 good. That's about as good as I'm gonna want to get there. Good. All right. So let's talk about addition. So we get, we already did addition where I basically went two plus three. Notice again, I can visualize, run it, and it's gonna be just great. Boom. And it didn't do anything, right? Because uh, it didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, I was hoping it was gonna show up over here, but I didn't actually ask it to remember anything. So I tell you what, that's fine. Let's edit the code and go A is equal to one and B, oh, we'll, we'll do the example that they actually had. So X is equal to one, Y is equal to two. And then basically I'm gonna say print uh, X, the operator here is what I'm paying attention to, X plus Y. All right, so if I go run, visualize the execution, I'm gonna fly right to the end uh addition good deal good let's do the other one now subtraction pretty easy subtraction and so we're going to get a nice little negative number there right boom negative one great 
Uh, let's go ahead. Don't fall asleep on me yet because I know that you guys in theory know your math, but we got to go through some of the basics. Multiplication, we go, go, let's again, an operator, multiplication operator, good deal. And then the division operator. And I would suspect that most of you, all of you even, would have no problem with what I've just done. And I'm actually kind of hoping that you were kind of bored. All right. So, uh, but those are all operators. Now the book kind of goes into the whole thing about order of operations. I will let you sort of uh, imagine that one, but basically if I go, you know, X plus Y multiplied by two or multiplied, excuse me, multiplied by Z, right? What's gonna happen first? Well, it's not gonna be that. That's not gonna happen first because multiplication takes place over division. Quick thing, which I'll probably put into the uh, uh, thing is there. Oh, look at, ooh, I wonder if this was paying attention. That popped up a little too easily. But anyway, the book does talk a little bit about order of operations and I will leave that for you to sort of look at. But as far as what I'm talking about here, the um, multiplication will happen first, then the addition. By the way, if you want to communicate this to people, Nothing wrong with a little bit of parentheses. This will do exactly the same run as the other one did. Uh, but the difference is it's easier to read and people don't have to know their order of operations. They'll know that that resolved first and then they'll do the addition. Okay, great. What else can we talk about with this? Well, here's what we can do. Um, let's talk a little bit about exponents first. So if I go uh, maybe let's get some slightly more interesting numbers now. Let's go four and five and six, four, five, six. So if I basically said, hey, I would like uh, five to the power of two. So what that's basically saying is give me five to the exponent of two. And I go run and that what that does is it gives me 16 because four to the power of two is 16. Pretty cool, all right. What about uh, if I said three, what would that be? That'd be four to the power of three. So it's gonna be four times four times four, which is going to be, I don't know my math, 64. Oh, I should have known that one by the way, 64. All right, pretty cool, right? So that's your exponents. Modulus is an interesting one and that will actually kind of be in the assignment. So we may as well talk about that a little bit. Modulus is when you take a, a number like X, for example, and you say, is it easily divisible by two. Is x divisible by two? We're going to go run. What it does is it took four, divided it by two, and the remainder is zero. Now let's see what happens when I take the same thing and I do it to the other numbers. So we're going to do y, we're going to do z, and I'm going to execute the thing and I'm going to run to the end. So notice that four divided by two is two with a remainder of zero. Five divided by two is two with a remainder of one. Six divided by two is three with a remainder of zero. You can kind of tell that if there is a remainder, it's not divisible by two. So that's what the modulus uh, does. Now, where this is interesting is if you had something like this. If this is uh, not zero, all right, if it's not zero, print, um, oh, it's not zero, it's odd. So uh, let's, um, we, do, we actually do no loops already. So I suppose what I could, could have done is uh, just done that. All right, so oops, not that one. Copy and paste and paste. All right, so I'm gonna go run, go to the end. Oh, that's interesting. Why did that fail? So if it's not equal to zero, oh, if print, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh, well, hopefully if one of you were in the class, you'd be going, Grant, what are you doing? And of course, print 
this isn't zero, it's actually the number. So, uh, so the word print is not helping me there. Let's do that. Let's run it again. All right, so we'll go. There you go. So uh, apparently it's only going to show up once. It's only going to show up as odd. I could have gone else even, but anyway. All right. So this is kind of a cool way right there to work out, is this an even or an odd number? Can it be divided by two with a remainder of zero? I've actually used that quite a few times um, uh, as, as one of the, you know, because every now and again, someone will ask me, why in the world would you care about modulus? And I got to tell you, one of them is to figure out if something's even or odd, or if something just evenly divides into another thing. The other thing uh, is that certain uh, things like barcodes or the Canadian social um, insurance number, they aren't just random numbers. They, there's actually an algorithm in place to prove whether this is a valid number. And part of that algorithm is modulus, all right? So, um, so for sure, I would say in your, in your toolkit, you're gonna wanna have plus minus multiplication division you definitely will want to have exponents and you will probably want to think about um, uh, uh, modulus because you'll need that. All right, so now let's talk about assignments. We want to talk about assignments versus comparisons. I and mean, you'll, I struggled a little bit on that on the, uh, maybe not the last lecture, but the one just, just before. So going back to my little Python tutor here and go edit. So assignments. So look at this, if I said that um, actually, do I still have my, uh, no, I don't, I don't have my thing. All right. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I'm going to bring back my Python interpreter, please. There you go. My command line interface. So I want you to imagine these are assignments. Okay. So what they do is they take the value on the right and move it in, well, copy it, I should say into the left. So when I go x is assigned 5, right, it looks like nothing's happened, but there is something big that's happened. And actually that was very visible here. If I go again, visualize and just go next, x is assigned 4, a piece of memory called x is created and 4 is stuck into that bucket. So that's x is assigned 5, assignment. We've done that now a few times. What about some of these? Well, these are actually really kind of cool. And honestly, most of the time, let's get Python visualizer out of the way. Most of the time, oh, they don't actually tell you what they are. Well, actually, that's cool right there. So I and and when I was doing the solutions to the last assignment, I was kind of falling all over myself because we uh, for a subtotal, for example, uh, in that solution, we had something like how the item the item total was 100 bucks, okay? And then I had a subtotal, which was zero. And then I basically went subtotal, subtotal total is assigned subtotal plus item total. And I kind of more or less said, um, I kind of said that uh, that if there's any other like Python people or C people even or other people from other languages that actually saw that they'd kind of go wait a minute there are actually shortcuts to that and there are actually shortcuts to this you could for example I could have gone subtotal plus equals item total. So what that does plus equals is it's basically it's shortcut saying variable is assigned the same variable plus whatever I was actually adding. So when I do this, now I'm at 200. All right. So the plus equals is a pretty important one because you tend to see that happening um, happening quite a bit. If you want to increment a counter, for example, let's imagine I have a counter which is assigned zero. And now I basically just want to keep incrementing it. Well, counter plus equals one. And now if I basically said, what's the counter? It's going to say it's one. When I go through the loop again, what's the counter? It's two. What's the counter? It's three, right? So the plus equals. Now I think I, I, this, I reserve the right for this not to work. 
No, it doesn't work. In certain languages, that does work, but in Python, that doesn't work. This is actually a even shorthand for that, uh, for, for the one above. So, so this assignment operator is shorthand for counter is assigned counter plus one. And then I'd say in even other languages like Java and C, that is a shorthand for even that, right? You'd actually say counter plus plus. All right, so that's the plus equals, the minus equals, the multiplication, division equals, and then a host of other things here, which uh, again, I, I'll, I'll let you look at. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty bizarre world. And the cool part about Python is that uh, the more you use it, the deeper you'll go and some of these operators may actually be interesting to you. Then we also have this idea of the, um, of the comparison operators. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the comparison operators. And now hopefully you can kind of get a better uh, understanding about what's going on um, with, with the difference between X is assigned one and X is equal to one. So in the first example, uh, a variable was created called X and the literal one was assigned to it. In the second example, X was compared to, to the literal of one, all right? And what did it come back? What did it return? It returned the Boolean value of true. And so if I was to say, so is X two, it's gonna be false. All right, is X nothing? It's gonna be false because X is something. All right, so uh, there's some neat kind of Booleans there and so Again, from the previous assignment, we had something like if x is one, if that is, uh, actually, hang on, hang on. Whoops, one more thing. Y is gotta be two for this example. All right, so what's x, what's y? Great, x greater than y? Nope, x equal to y? Nope. X less than Y? Yep. All right. So our example from the homework was actually if X is greater than Y, if that is true, that then do something. Okay. Okay. So that's what we had. Now, I was saying even there that, that could be further simplified, right? Because we already know that X is in fact, or in this case, not uh, greater than y. What was the true one? It was, it was, it was less, right? So we already know x is the, that that already resolves to true. So basically, saying x is less than y is equal to true. Oh, why is that? Going? Oh, I wonder if there's an order of operations going there. Let's try one. X less than y equal to true. Yeah, there you go. Why, right there, you saw a nice little order of operations problem. What happened there is that this takes precedence over this. So what it did is it said, is Y equal to true? And of course, Y is not, because Y is equal to two. So then it basically, this resolved to false, and then X is less than false. And so it says that doesn't make any sense because it's false. Yeah, right. I hope you're not listening to this uh, too late at night. Anyway, but what I wanted to say is that this guy up here, is kind of a long way to say what we're getting. We basically just wanna know, is that true? So because that resolved to true and then we get another equals true resolves to true, we could have rewritten that to basically say, if X is less than Y, um, so just basically that, we could have left off that further thing, then print whatever. Okay, that would have been a nice shortcut there and you'll notice that that thing worked. Okay, so great. So there's there's some sort of uh, operators there and that should take us through uh, between the textbook and between what I'm showing here that, um, that takes us through those pages. Then we get this idea that you can com um, you can actually compare, we're gonna, I'm gonna stop right after this logical operators. So I think really what we're seeing here is good enough. Logical operators are ways to combine the results of two comparisons. So in this case, X is less than five, X is less than 10. 
So if this is true, and if that is true, then together they'll be true, right? Uh, or if that is true and that is true, then yes, they'll, they'll, they'll resolve. Or basically if this is true and that isn't, then it won't. If this is false and this is true, oh, whoa, I think I blew that one. One more time, one more time. If both are true, and it's only important for one to be true, which is what the order is saying, then it's gonna be true. If either one of these are true, then it's gonna be true. If of course both are false, then it's not true, so it's false. And then you get this idea of not, which is basically saying if it's not one of these. So let's just have a little bit of fun with this. Um, so this is basically saying X is five and X is 10. So X is greater than five at uh, three and X is less than 10. So that becomes true. All right. So now let's do this. It's important. This is absolutely impossible mathematically, by the way, you can't have X. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, you can. You can have X being greater than three and X being greater than 10. Cause of course, if X was 15, that would have come out as true. All right. So cool. Holy smokes, man. Come back. Okay, good deal. But now when X was originally five, this is going to be true. And, uh, and that won't be true. All right, so we got a false. What if I substituted that with an or? This is the winner, so it's true. And just so you know, probably in the background of Python, once it hit one of them, it's not even gonna bother testing the second one. So I could continue this one by going or X is greater than 20, or X is greater than 30. That's a lot of comparisons. And I wish I could show you, but I bet you behind the scenes, as soon as one popped out as true, it said, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not testing this. I'm not going to go anymore. You wouldn't either, right? I mean, once you know it's true, you're out. All right. Um, and then the other thing was not. So let's do this. Uh, okay. So let's go back to this guy. This guy is basically going to resolve to true. And then I'm going to go not. So it's not. If that is, is that not the case? All right. So it basically reverses it. All right. So there you go. Okay. So that's enough fun for for uh, for this part of, of the lecture. The next one, I'm, I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to start really hitting the um, the uh, example that we're sort of seeing on page whatever, basically exercise lab 3A. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about, um, yeah, conversions of uh, from Fahrenheit to Celsius. That's sort of our, 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 our next deal. All right. Good enough for now.